Hello, I'm Mary Ito, and welcome to the Cram Podcast. People behaving badly. Do you think you're seeing more and more of this? Does it seem that good manners, politeness, and respectful behavior is going down the tubes? It can happen with strangers on the street, maybe in a store, when you're driving, all kinds of inconsiderate and rude behavior. And you've witnessed it with politicians and other leaders, celebrities, and people who want their 15 minutes of fame. The world seems less friendly, even dangerous, and you wonder, What's going on? What's happening with civility in our supposedly civil society? We explore this question with Professor Mervyn Horgan. He's with the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Guelph. Hi, Mervyn. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Mary. Happy to happy to talk with you today. So, you know, I think many people, and certainly I've talked to a lot of people about this, whether it's family, friends, colleagues, neighbors. I think they feel that there's been this decline in in good behavior, um, maybe even civility in a general way, um, and that this has been going on for a while, like certainly since pandemic restrictions have lifted or maybe even before that. What do you think? Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I feel similar, maybe anecdotally, uh, you know, uh, uh, online incivility is is very prevalent and uh, social media has driven it or, you know, there seems to be a kind of a decline of parliamentary decorum, say, and kind of what are supposedly formal environments where we kind of expect kind of norms and of politeness and civility to prevail. But I think it's important to distinguish between how we kind of talk about it and what's actually happening on the ground. Um, and one big thing, I think, it, when we talk about about kind of decline of of norms uh, of of civility or polite behavior, is that this is a sort of a perennial concern, right? This is historically every generation thinks that the the next generation is ruder, uh, doesn't respect their elders as well, uh, um, you know, doesn't understand politeness. Uh, that we're all certain, you know, uh, we're definitely going to hell in a handbasket because the young people these days, X, Y, Z, right, do this and that, right? So that's, this is a sort of a perennial concern, I think. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, um, uh, a fact of generational difference in general, I think, right? Um, but I, but I think there is a, a, a kind of a growing concern uh, recently. There, there does seem to be a, a sort of a heightened concern around it, I think, that that has, you know, that, that does to me seem to have some legitimacy. Yeah. So I I do want to get into that. But just before we do, I mean, you do bring up a good point that, yeah, every generation seems to think that, oh, the next generation is just getting worse. Is there any kind of connection between that thinking and the loss of formality? Yeah, well, so so in in the social sciences, we we would call about we would you know we like adding uh, isations onto words uh, um, to to sound smart, but also uh, so we we use the term informalization, right? We could talk about the informalization of uh, you know um, casual Fridays at work, right? Previously, in a professional job on on Bay Street in downtown Toronto, you wore a suit. Maybe now on Fridays, uh, you mightn't quite show up in your pajamas, but you know maybe you wear your hoodie. Um, the sort of Google campus effect, let's say, you know, where you're playing ping pong and hanging in a bean bag while you're bringing in your six figures, as opposed to, you know, dreaming of the corner office and, uh, and your, uh, what, your, your thing going back and forth on your desk, right? your gravity <laughs> yeah, toy, right. um, you know, your, your madman style thing, let's say. Um, but, you know, so there is a kind of a greater informalization, let's say, and the sort of decline of the use of honorifics is kind of interesting, right? Uh, I think like calling people doctor, professor, etc. Um, so one thing that's kind of interesting about that, I think, um, is the 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 decline of the use of, of terms like doctor, professor, um, um you know, a lot, of, a lot of students were just immediately, I've, I've had students, kind of first year students come and say, uh, hey, Merv. And I'm like, mm, you know, my family calls me Merv, right? <laughs> you, know, but like, let's, you know, there's, I mean, in a large class, let's say, you know, it doesn't have to be fully formal, but, you know, right. maybe, you know, I, I did a lot of study to get a PhD, let's say. But it's sort of interesting to think, say, in the university, the decline of honorifics happens at the same time as the sort of tr- like the the university is less and less a bastion of kind of white male privilege let's say so there's the entry of of much more diverse groups into the higher 
you know, into higher ranks in universities, let's say, that the decline of, of honorifics happens at the same time. And I, th I think that's curious because, um, uh, you know, people people work hard to get to earn a earn a higher degree, let's say, or to earn to become a, a a doctor or you know to become a medical doctor or something. Right. So the the sort of uh, the decline of that is is sort of curious. So there there may be a connection between those things. I don't know if it's a direct line, but they they seem to be happening sim more or less simultaneously. I would say. You know, I because I, I'm what I'm thinking is, you're right. Your family calls you Merv, right? Yeah. And. Yeah. You know, I mean, you hope your family treats you with respect, but they don't necessarily do that in kind of a, a, a regular formalized way every day. I mean, you deal with them every day, right? And there are certain liberties I think we allow within families, which could be even rudeness at times. Mm -hmm. Whereas with strangers, and if you put a title in front of that, I wonder if that does create an automatic uh, kind of feeling that we, we need to be more respectful. We need to show politeness. I mean, the biggest example I can think of would be royalty. Sure. You know, sure. we're yeah. not just going to say, you know, hey, Chuck. Yeah. You King Charles. Well, you, you, know? <laughs> you, you, mind, you mind, Mary. I, I might. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, then, but then I don't know. For some reason, I'm also thinking that, hey, Chuck can also possibly like it's is that kind of a slippery slope to maybe a, a rudeness or a, a kind of informal behavior that might be seen as rude you know that i don't know you raise an interesting yeah. question yeah i mean so this i think this is part of why i I'd, I'd say like i wouldn't like to draw a direct line between yeah. them let's say um you know because uh, there's also a way in which the sort of let's say the use of of these you know formal terms are also a sort of a way of policing who's in and who's out you know it's a way of kind of of pulling rank yeah. um you know i bet i i suspect it doesn't fly in the military let's say um, you know, I don't know if you remember uh, when the Obamas went to visit um, Lizzie, uh, Queen Elizabeth, um, <laughs> um, that they uh, and and I think Michelle Obama maybe put her hand on her arm or something, and this was a huge deal uh, in, the, in the press, right? You don't touch the Queen, right? You right. Nobody, um, I, I assume, I, yeah. So. Uh, I assume she does, does. She was doing some personal care for her own body. Maybe, maybe she. You know, I don't know who who attended to her. But um, but this general sort of informalization is is kind of interesting. I don't. I I I'm I'm suspicious of saying that they're 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 directly connected. Mm, I mean, so mm -hmm. I think you know, there's there's some kind of interesting things about it too. Uh, let's say um, this like uh, formal dining, like like high end dining now. Uh, previously, it was you know a, a, a snobby French waiter who looked down on you and uh, with you know fine dining, white tablecloths, etc. Um, whereas now your kind of expensive restaurant is you know the gruff-looking bearded chef with tattoos who comes out and goes, "Hey man, you know how you know do you want you know how do, how bloody do you want your steak, man? Whatever, not you know yeah. and it was the foie gras, right? You know, so there's a there's a sort of a transformation has happened there too. Not that's not to say that the the traditional form of fine dining doesn't still exist, but you can mm -hmm. you can go eat a five hundred dollar meal if you have that kind of money, and uh, and true. there might be bare bare concrete walls and and chipped cutlery or chipped cups. I don't, well, maybe not. Yeah, and that no, but in that scene is being cool. <laughs> um, I, I, a lot of it is driven by technology, and that's that's you know in our age certainly, um, you know, uh, social media and, and smartphones and everything. But I think that this is also true of of uh, the adoption of every kind of technology that comes on board. You have when you have a technology adopted, you have a sort of a simultaneous kind of a we call it a technophilic like a falling in love with the technology and a technophobic tendency happens simultaneously so when the radio is invented it's like oh my god nobody's ever going to learn to read again right, right? uh we're, right. they're, they're going to be putting thoughts in our minds then television is invented and everyone's like oh my god people are never going to socialize again because they just nobody go to the cinema again right um so every every technology has this has this sort of reaction to it. And, you know, you, I think the best thing to do is to be kind of agnostic about, about technology, for example, right? It's good and it's bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, but what if it's different? But what if this time it's different? Right. It's okay. All, what if, what if, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but what if, what if yeah. AI is the one that is really yeah. different because it is most like us? Right, right. It is more and more like us. But but again, yeah. I mean, if you look, you know, if you were to look back historically, it would be like, hold on a second, a voice can trans, a voice can come across through the air. Is that God? Right. That's what people talk to people talk about radio. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, so I but but I mean, I think AI, you know, we're, we're always kind of there's, there's a sort of a always a danger of presentism thinking the the moment we're in is is utterly unique. And it is. But, you know, there are there are sort of uh, uh, patterns and consistencies to how um, societies tend to react to to rapid transformations.
Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think you've explained a little bit of it, but I, I want to go, I want to dig a bit deeper um, sure. because, you know, you were saying that uh, historically, I guess we go through these kind of cycles, right? Where people think it's getting worse, but you know, it's not necessarily, but you did say there are some reasons we should be concerned today, right? About mm-hmm. what we're mm-hmm. seeing about civility. What do we know about what causes like bad behavior in civility in general? Well, so it, it, it's partly context dependent, for example. So, um, you know, there's a lot of literature, uh, you know, one big area where people study incivility is in workplaces, right? Because this is uh-huh. in, in occupational psychology. This is a kind of a concern in HR and in retention of staff, right? Uh, um, you, you know, you if you have a, a workplace where people feel like they're being treated in rude ways all the time, they're, they're, they might well leave, right? Um, or it's just going to be kind of a nasty place place to be. Um, and so a fairly robust finding in in the sort of literature on workplace incivility, um, particularly in healthcare settings, actually, it's been a lot of work done on um, on interactions between doctors and nurses uh, and amongst nurses, for example. Um, and one uh, uh, a fairly consistent finding is that when you have um, higher ups, uh, people who are high ranking within institutions, um, if they're rude downward, Right, if they're rude to, to lower downs, then that tends to to promote rudeness and incivility amongst people amongst people who are status equal. Right, so if doctors are rude to nurses, that tends can tend to um, to create a sort of a, 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 a more um, more uncivil conduct between nurses. Right, now that's oh. not you know it's not it's not it's not like one hundred percent like if it, if, right. it, if right. a doctor is rude, all the nurses are rude. Right, but that that there's a tendency within institutions for that to happen. Um, has that been studied uh, more generally in other kinds of occupations? There, I think there is a general, um, you know, we, like if we think about, for example, the decline of parliamentary decorum, right? Yes. And if we yes. have, if we have, if we have leaders who are, uh, or you know, very uh, uh, high status individuals in politics, right. because they're in powerful positions, who are consistently rude, right? And uh, Mr. Trump being a fairly, <laughs> you know, a pretty a pretty good example in this uh, 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 in this case, um, that you know we we could probably ex- we we you know intuitively it makes sense to us I think to to kind of say that there's some sort of Trump effect that the you know the existence of Trump and Trump's sort of rise to power has has helped to sort of this sort of uh, spread of of more uncivil well, behavior. If yeah, you like. well, and, I th- would, and I think that's yeah. yeah. Some would say even permission. When, when yes, well, I think, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, that, and things, oh, things, well, that, things that you, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and you know, sort of op- openly mocking people with physical disabilities and things. It's like you know, that's that sort of thing that we kind of had that had just kind of disappeared from our culture, yeah. really, or you know, or had really had had not been prominent at least, you know, pr- where yeah, it previously absolutely. would have been. But, you know, well, um, I, yeah, I want to spend some time talking about that because people mm-hmm. have often talked about that Trump effect. You know, what's mm-hmm. interesting though, going back to what you were saying about the evidence in healthcare and showing that um, downward effect, you know, when when healthcare mm-hmm. leaders don't act well, and then mm-hmm. the people below them, um, you know, they, they don't act well to each other. The reason I was asking whether it's been studied in other occupations is I was wondering whether it's actually not the issue of healthcare. You know, the fact that it happened in healthcare is almost besides the point. I was mm-hmm. wondering whether it's a leadership thing. And then yeah. again, yeah, connected to Trump and, and maybe other, like other leaders. I mean, if you went to another corporation, for example, and the people at the top were acting badly, would the same effect occur? Like, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I, I suspect so. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't know of, of data that would say that, you know, if, uh, um, uh, although it did seem say for you know uh reports on when uh, Musk took over Twitter, the place seemed to become pretty toxic very quickly. Right. And and that yeah, was that's maybe also connected to the sort of routing of the, you know, he kind of did a lot of layoffs and threatened, you know, was yeah. more threatening when he came in. Right. But uh, the, the, the one thing about c- c- the, the kind of use of the term civility, let's say, is uh, or, or rude or um, impoliteness, right, or politeness, is that it sort of um, it immediately invokes its opposite. So if I say I'm civil, right, I'm suggesting something else is uncivil or something else is barbaric, right? Civil, civil, civilization versus barbarism, right. right? Or if I'm saying, you know, uh, I'm polite, that's implying that something else is impolite. And often uh, this has been sort of norms of civility have been a sort of a way to do a kind of a policing of behavior that has been connected often to class culture, right? So, you know, um, uh, 
uh, well, you know, I go to the opera, I don't, but, you know, I, I go to the opera and you watch NASCAR, right? Uh, you know, one, one of those is a sort of a civilized activity, you know, and one of those mm. is, is really, you know, highbrow, lowbrow, right? So you get all these sort of class dimensions layered on top. Uh, and certainly they're, they can be racialized, right? Certainly in North America, right? There can be a racial dimension yes. to the types of, the types of consumption activities that some groups are more interested in than others, right? And the sort of, um, meanings that are attached to those more broadly, right? So, you know, what's, what's a, what's a more civilized form of consumption, right? Of, of a good, um, you know, I, yeah, eating organic you, you, versus, you know, yeah, these, these sorts no, of boundaries. Absolutely. So, you, you so do, this sort of binary, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 you do really bring up a great point because, you know, then it kind of brings up the question, a big, the bigger question of who defines what civility is, who exactly, determines right. that? Yeah. So that's that's really really interesting, right? So there's yeah. you know uh, you know nerdy academic uh, that I am. I'm, I'm sort of really interested in etymology, the origin of words, right? And there's a direct connection between um, the civility and culture, right? To be cultured is to be civilized, right? That's interesting, right? Um, you know, so there's, there's, these these terms are sort of uh, are, are kind of tied together, and there's there's a lot of kind of historical work has been has been done on this. There's a great old book in sociology by a guy called. Uh, Norbert Elias called the civilizing process that looks at like the evolution, the transformations in manners over time in Europe. Um, and, you know, people, people don't believe this, but, you know, in the, in the 15th and 16th century, aristocrats ate with their hands, spat and snotted on the tables, soiled themselves while eating meals together. Right. That this is what this is. This was the behavior of aristocrats. Right. Uh, but that was, that was then they were the civilized ones. Right. And meanwhile, they might've been going around slaughtering the barbarians elsewhere in the world right you know so um so who, who sets the terms right is really interesting so there's a sort of a form of there's a kind of a boundary drawing policing of behavior that is that is not just about the behavior right that's connected mm -hmm. to, to to class race gender right how, how women comport themselves right men man spreading right they, these sorts of things are right they're they're very interesting to, so to, to kind of think through yeah, it, they, because you're right. Because in that case, then, you know, determining whether civility is deteriorating or not becomes mm -hmm. a really complicated question. Very, very. Yeah. And I think there's one, yeah. one thing, just, just to, to, to go back a little, you said, you know, kind of what, what might be causing it or thinking about institutions. One thing that, that we really, um, that's often, uh, you know, we, we tend to say it's, it's something about the character of that person, right? That person, that rude person, oh, they're like, they have no morals or they're poorly raised or, you know, they're, they're, um, uh, they're low class, right? Or something like this, right? There's kind of a moral judgment attaches to it. Uh, one thing we might think about is, Badly designed spaces. I'm interested in, in incivilities between strangers in public space. That's kind of part of what I study. And uh, uh, badly designed entrances to subway stations, right? Union Station, out the new Go platform. I take the Go sometimes, right? From oh, so you're Toronto talking about in Toronto. Union in Toronto, Station let's say, Toronto, right? Yes. Like, let's say, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And uh, let's say um, a, a badly designed, like a, a doorway that is too small for the volume of people that need to use it. That's mm. going to be a site of nonstop aggravation between people right right um you know okay why don't we just like, toronto yeah, why don't we just yeah. talk about toronto transit and getting around the city as a whole <laughs> that's sure, driving sure, people sure. crazy yeah. yeah 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 and i mean you know so I, d I don't want to kind of minimize the fact you know there of course there have been huge issues on Toronto transit on, on the ttc and there have been you know there have been it's it, it there, mm -hmm. there's a period and i meant sort of in general the roads and quite all, scary. Yeah, oh yes all the, oh yeah, okay just yeah, generally yeah, yeah. construction okay. getting around yeah Sure. And, and, you know, like road rage is, is yeah. you know, a, a very popular thing to talk about, let's say. Um, and, you know, uh, cars are kind of interesting because they are any kind of form of automobile because they remove us from one another. And we have, um, there's a great study done in LA in the, in the 1990s um, on driving in LA. And uh, the uh, guy by the name of Jack Katz came up with the term, you know, cars are a problem because we have limited expressive equipment in a car. You have a honk, you have your brake, and you have your middle finger. So that's that's the extent of communication, of, of kind of devices you have for communicating with other drivers, right? Maybe a flick of the lights. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, you yeah, know what? Yeah, I yeah. hadn't thought of that, but yeah, I don't want to yeah. leave it just at that because I think mm -hmm. that lets some people off with their own personal responsibility being in the oh, car. For sure. Right. For sure. Because, you know, I often feel too, you're in a car, you're protected, you're a stranger, people, don't, and you can just race ahead. So, you know, you're rude. You do something that's very rude to someone and mm -hmm. then you just take off. There's no consequence sure. to that. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Potentially, I mean, the, the, increasingly, I mean, we, we we see cases where somebody gets chased yeah. down, and yeah. you know, this is this sort of thing. And so, I'm, I'm not saying like design is you know bad design is why people yeah. are rude, but but you know, there's a, a wonderful study done in Australia where they did a very huge telephone survey of people's everyday experiences uh, with strangers, uh, encounters with strangers in public spaces, and they basically found you know they, they were tracking it and they were doing kind of a very methodical study, making sure they had representative sample of you know different. Uh, age groups, uh, uh, gender, etc., in in in, uh, in Australian society, and um, and they found basically like the that people reported more rude encounters at rush hour in the morning and rush hour in the evening mm. because there's more people around to right. pack densely dense spaces. Right? It's it's obvious when you say it, but it's sort of like, well, you know, it, is it is it because eight a.m. is you know a, a time when everyone just is in a bad mood? Not necessarily. It's just that we're all more densely packed together, right? In cities, in particular. Um, and maybe they're not as well designed for us to get around. So it, we're a little less tolerant with one another. I need to, I need to get to my nine yeah, o'clock right. meeting, right? You know, and mine's really important, not yours, right? The other thing too is, um, I didn't ask you, but if if leadership, bad leadership, can produce a negative effect among the behavior of people, right, who work at a place, mm -hmm. do, does that does bad behavior tend to happen from the top down, or can? Do, can can it happen from the bottom up? Well, um, this is a this is a perennial question uh, in in the social sciences, right? Is, is it, it a big is debate? It sort of, is it a big? Yeah, debate? yeah. I mean, you know, we have we have versions of it, right? So, you know, like, uh, do do is there sort of are there abstract structures, things outside of us, powerful leaders, uh, big big things weighing down on us that force us to do certain things, or do we sort of? voluntarily do we act and then those make those bigger things happen right this is yeah. you know and the, the question you know it's a uh, it's of course exceedingly complicated and the, the the answer is it's both right um both of those things can be true okay so th this i wanted to come back to trump right i want to talk yeah, about him yeah. for a minute um so do you do you believe that there is something called the trump effect that there really is an effect that he has had on people um, and uh, whether you want to call it permission or has allowed people or people have been motivated to act badly or in a rude way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, I think in particular um, around, you know, s you know, saying saying out loud things that maybe people might think, but that we had sort of maybe moved past, right, in terms of sort of thinking about social inclusion, thinking about a, a more inclusive and open society where we were respectful of one another's differences. And, you know, to, um, I think that's, that's you know, real damage has been done to that sort of progress um, in our society. I think in, 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 in North American Western society generally, I think, has happened on, on, the, on the back of on the back of Trump, right? But that's not to say that it's a, you know, that it's a absolute spiral, you know, that it's, you know, that it's guaranteed now that we're, there's the only way is down, right? Um, uh, I think, but I, yeah, I think, I mean, I, it really has had a profound effect, not just in politics, right? Yeah. Not just in the, in the no, rise of no. kind of, well, in a, a sort I, of a rightward lurch in politics, but generally I think it's, it has made it permissible, right? To, yeah. to sort of, to engage with, um, people in really bad faith kind of ways. Mm -hmm. which, well, yeah. I just did an interview um, about hate crimes. And right. uh, one of the researchers was saying, who studies hate crimes, that um, there has been a, a rise, a spike uh, since the Israel-Hamas war in mm -hmm. hate crimes against people on both sides, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on mm -hmm. both Jews and Palestinians. Um, but that you can point to even before the war and before the pandemic to 2016. And mm -hmm. so she said it coincidentally that does, you know, that runs into the same timeline as Trump mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. to power. Mm -hmm. Not a direct yeah. line, but it is interesting that that the two coincide. Yeah, um, yeah. But then, but so my question to you, Mervyn, though, is, okay, you know, you, you, well, you even said, were these things that we had been thinking um, but we knew they were wrong to say them out loud, right? But it's something that we might have harbored and we sort of suppressed, mm -hmm. but maybe Trump allowed us because he gave mm -hmm. voice to it. So, you know, Trump is one man. And do we not also have to take our own personal responsibility in our behavior, whether or not it was prompted by Trump? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, where's our, sure. where's our inner voice to say, no, you know, he said that, and maybe I think that, but I shouldn't be saying that out loud. Uh, it may be that people 
previously were just in communities and in their small peer groups or in their, you know, hanging out in their basements with their buddies, this was all going on. Yes. Right? Yes. Which I suspect it was, right? I mean, that, mm. that you know, the Trump thing about the locker room talk? Yeah. Um, you know, male locker room talk can be a pretty weird kind of thing, to be honest, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe maybe that, that maybe has gone into decline a little bit. I'm not sure, right? As maybe when I was younger, it was more like that. But um, but no, you bring up a good yeah, point. You're right. Yeah, maybe this was already yeah. going around in small, you know, ex- exclusive kind of it, communities or circles. And yeah. this now, because it's so public, it's okay. Like it's yeah. okay to, to bring this out in the public. And it might be when it was, when it's happening in this kind of smaller thing, it might be semi-organized in some places, right? Sort of neo-Nazi groups or something like this, right? Or organized mm-hmm. racist mm-hmm. sort of, right? But it might've just been kind of casual sort of racist talk among, among white guys or something like this, right? But yeah. now that, that that has kind of re-entered the public arena, something that's now said yeah. in the public arena again, right? Um, so okay, let me ask you it, this. It might so be too. that's more public, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but... Should Trump, and again, I'm, I'm looking at responsibility, should he bear more responsibility than the average person because he is in the position of being a leader? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, so a leader is, you know, someone, and this is, this is something, you know, that we, in, in sociology and anthropology, we certainly look at is like a, a leader is someone that in, in whom the sort of values of a group if, if you know a leader of a group of a society of a province of a city whatever should in some way um inhabit the ideals of that group right should be able to find a way to articulate and speak in a way that that reflects and and uh, that not only reflects that expresses but also kind of kind of asks people to bring themselves up to those kind of higher ideals right so um you know if we think about um um when before obama was sort of anyone right before obama ran and he did his speech at the at the democratic national convention i don't know if you remember that that was 20 yes yes seems seems like a lifetime ago at this no, point yeah but, uh, no i mean many people were blown know, away many people it was were, it was like who yeah. is this guy i'm yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Witness, I'm witnessing i'm witnessing history here right something is happening here right and then um and it was it was like how do i it was you know generations since we heard somebody talk in a way that really Ask you know you you have presidents always say you know with these United States and talk about the ideals but this felt much more like a much more authentic kind of a performance it felt like he was he embodied and was inhabiting those ideals right and that's the kind of that's the the kind of ideal of a leader right so when then let's say you have a leader who articulates things that maybe expresses the ideals of particular subsets right whether those are yes, racist yes, right whatever they yes, are right anti immigrant yes, kind of sentiments yes. now you have oh oh my my anti immigrant sentiment is now being expressed as a as a collective ideal for for a whole society woohoo i'm now in power right i'm yeah, now i'm now yeah. i'm i'm now empowered to speak yes right? um, you know what that and yeah and yeah. so if if yeah. that if that is speaking to their truth mm-hmm. the youth, right the truth that they actually do believe in but was mm-hmm. not uh, permissible before then then really does that bad behavior or is that bad behavior really bad behavior at all in right. their eyes? Right. I mean, don't they see that as being finally we get to speak our truth. It is about time that. So mm-hmm. that's not bad behavior at all in their right. eyes. That's what I'm saying. Right. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, so, you know, so and then, you know, you so you see this sort of manifestation of this then, let's say, uh, the sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, fairly organized attack on sort of diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives in lots of institutions that's really ramped up in the last, yeah. you know, it feels like a, it, like we're right in the middle of it, right? In the last couple of years, that's really ramped up, right? You know, um, and that these are, these were sorts of ideals that may, were, that are practices that we're seeking to, to bring to fruition ideals around creating more inclusive institutions, right? Um, and now that that's kind of under attack. And so is the, so what it means is, the institutions should go back to being dominated by <laughs> a very small subset of the population, right? Uh, who've traditionally wielded all the power, right? Or a huge amount of power. So, I mean, okay, now I, I do want to sort of move on now and look at mm-hmm. if this is what is going on and we see leaders, um, and not just Trump, but other leaders mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. acting so, you know, badly, if you want to put it that way. Um we're not leaders, right? Many of us are not leaders. We don't have that kind of power. So from the ground up, you know, if we feel that this is not a good thing, that we're disturbed by seeing this deterioration of behavior, you know, in certain sectors, in, in everyday life even, what what can we do about it? 
we always need to be careful with our speech, I think. Um, uh, that's that's important. Careful with what we say. Um, people who have, you know, you know, we're not necessarily leaders. We might have position where we're where we have some power within a place in a workplace. You know that we're we're some you know somewhat higher rank than someone else in a workplace and stuff. And uh, um, you know, and as you know, speaking personally, as I, I've learned as I've you know kind of developed my career over time, that a, a you know a, a positive word to somebody who's you know, in a more vulnerable position within within an institution like a university, right, it can have a can have an incredible effect on somebody, right? Every, everyone has a the story from their childhood of the teacher who said something kind or nasty to them that sent them that they felt sent them on a particular trajectory, right? A, te- a teacher says, "Oh, well, you're a really great writer." How many writers have you heard say that, right? Maybe they were just an okay writer. Maybe they were a B plus writer, and the teacher said, "Well, that's a really nice sentence or something." And then and now they're a poet or something, right? They're now they're a published author, right? Um, so I think that that sort of uh, awareness of the sort of power of of words and very mundane, simple kinds of inter- encounters and interactions. Um, um, and then my my kind of real thing, I think, is finding, um, you know. We, the, the, the phone kind of dominates our lives, right? And people are yes. spending, you know, there was a story I heard yesterday. Somebody was doing an experiment or kind of personal experiment where they they had got, uh, gotten a flip phone and um, went or went off their, had been off for a month or something. And they were kind of like, you know, I was up to like my, my reports were telling me I was watch, looking at my phone for six hours a day. So if I'm looking at my phone for six hours a day and let's say, you know, four of those hours, there are other human beings nearby to me. Um, the information I'm getting on that is is yes, it's the broader world I live in, but it's not the immediate world I live in, right? It's not the right. world where my body moves. It's not the same environment where my body is moving around. So I'm really interested in kind of thinking about spaces where we are physically present together, right? Be, where, whether that's a, a subway car, which is kind of weird because it's a bit of a sardine can, so we're kind of constrained and there's no escape. It's a little bit, they're kind of funny, kind of strange places, but public spaces, right? So yeah. public spaces in cities, parks, um, I'm, I, I'm, I kind of, I think ice rinks, uh, outdoor public ice rinks are a sort of a, a utopian form of social life, right? Where you come there for every generation, you can be the worst skater on earth, or you can be uh, an Olympian uh, figure skater or an NHL star, and you can have fun there. Um, and you can share that space. And we're kind of there together for pleasure. Now, this is this is kind of a utopian idea. But if you take, take kind of um, little, like, uh, what would you say, sort of, um, you know, what are the features of spaces that we find it pleasurable to be together? And how might we replicate those or how might we enhance those in different places? You know, so my one of my favorite examples is if you ask people about New York City, people will say New York City, people are, you know, it's cold. Everyone's just about the dollar. Somebody will step over you. You know, just, somebody will step over you if you're dying just to get to where they're going or something, right? Go to New York and sit on a bench. Sit on a bench in Washington Square Park or something, right? In a big city, in a, in a, in a big park in New York. And you will have conversations. Somebody will just sit down next to you and you'll have a conversation. Now, sometimes it might be a little scary, but more often than not, it'll just be, you'll mm-hmm. have a conversation. See you later, right? That doesn't happen yeah. on subways as much. <laughs> Generally, you know right? what? But, you're so, you're, you're yeah, totally yeah. pointing to that whole, I guess, area of research about happiness or moments of joy with mm-hmm. strangers. That, that yeah, the, so yeah. talking to strangers and connecting with them can actually bring us moments of joy. Um, yeah, and I, and I think you know, there's, yeah. there's there's a good you know there's kind of a positive psychology dimension for that from an individual perspective, but you know, thinking kind of at a, at a broader societal level, um, sort of how like th- it's those little things that give give that bind a society together, right? That kind yeah. of that buffer against kind of fragmentation and the idea that we're isolated and alone, right? And so yeah. if we have if we have more opportunities to be bound together, to have whether those are kind of having shared goals, being involved in helping to build something in your in your local community or something, right? Or contributing in some way to your to your your kids' school, right? Or to to your workplace or something. You know right? what? That totally yeah. makes sense because as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, what are the public spaces when, and you said people of different generations, you know, different backgrounds can come together and different class. Like I was trying to think, can I even think of one place or an event where people who are very rich and very poor and everything in between come together? I'm, I don't, I'm not sure I can think of it right off the top of my head. 
but, yeah, but so, so I, that's so important. I, I get what you're saying. Totally. Yeah, totally. Right. So um, and so this is why public institutions are really important. Right. So libraries, you know, um, libraries are are very different beasts to what they were a generation ago. Right. They're, they're social yeah. service agencies where they're really important. Right. Particularly yeah. it's the housing crisis. But then public institutions like public schools are really important because you have people from widely divergent backgrounds come together. Right. When you have a public health care system, for example, um, uh, you know, both as a workplace and as a place where we go for healthcare, you, I could be sitting next to a CEO, I could be sitting next to a homeless person, right? Yeah, and they're, they're very yeah. important. So th those are kinds of spaces. But then more generally, I mean, th those are kind of functional spaces where you're going because you have to, you know, there's something you got to do right. like the, uh, to get your driver's license. I like that, like the driver's license office is probably where you get the, the greatest cross section because you can't delegate it to somebody else to get That's your driver's true. license yeah. for you, right? <laughs> <That's true. Okay. laughs> like, you can you can mail in now, I guess. So it's a little bit different. But, <laughs> so we have but, to know, make so... it more conducive to talking to people. In driver's <laughs> license <places>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then, but then you're going to be going, hold on, what number are you know I'm ahead of you, okay, you know? but uh, but I think but but thinking about you know there's a, I like there's a, a um, an Australian sociologist has used the term kind of where can we have kind of unpanicked interactions where what are spaces mm. right so parks are uh, show potential for this I think um, you know we have and there's some great parks we have some great parks in Canada right it doesn't have to be big national parks you know that you're Algonquin or something like this right or provincial no but you're parks, right, right? But, and you know, the pandemic spaces right, right? We, allowed that, yeah parks were thriving everybody was totally, going out to parks totally and spaces that we simply share and maybe maybe I don't even interact but I go oh well look look there's a family from another part of the world that are engaged in some activity I have no idea what it was cool. beautiful and I, I'm doing my thing here I'm playing soccer or I'm doing whatever and uh yeah right um you know and I, I like I'm, I'm I like pick up soccer right I pick up sports I think are really important I, I think have a or I have a, there's a sort of a an uh are a kind of an undervalued social asset if you like um because you know I'm, I came to move to Canada as an immigrant uh, 24 years ago and I was I would just go to the park and play soccer and suddenly I'm playing with people from yeah. around the world we have very basic rules we agree on you know don't handle the yeah. ball it's a friendly game, so you're not going to do vicious tackles and you're just kind of chatting and, and it's kind of free and easy kind of forms of sociability. So how can we, how, how do we cultivate those sorts of spaces and activities that people can engage in where we're not kind of saying where the first question isn't, you know, uh, you know, are you a, are you a, a right wing ideologue or a lefty pinko? Are you, you know, where do you stand yeah. on yeah. this war or this issue, right? Where where we're just kind of sharing the space. And I, I think those are really, really important. And I'm, I'm and assuming, if, oh, sorry, Marvin, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that yeah. there's probably evidence to show that when you have that mix um, in a, in a, um, a friendly space, like in a welcoming mm -hmm. space, when you have that mix of, you know, rich people, poor people, people of different backgrounds, education levels, you know, all that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it's more difficult to behave badly towards each other. So now, now we're now we're in the good space, right? Because now I think this. So with our Trump effect, social media, yeah, all that stuff, yeah. I th I think a big part of what COVID did was we didn't have opportunities to have those kinds of spaces, or when we were in those spaces, they were no longer kind of on panic spaces. If you, you were like, oh my god, being around people is actually potentially a threat to me. Right. right? I, I I could potentially get sick, or I might make somebody sick. Right. Um. So that's that's I think a, a big part that we didn't have those sorts of settings to have those kind of collective rituals where we're not we're not necessarily fully engaged with each other, but we're we're sharing space and we have a sense of being part of something, even though I don't know who anyone around me is, or I, I'm with my little my crew here. Right. But we lost that with COVID, and I think that's that's a bit of a that's part of the effect I think that maybe has helped to kind of ramp up the the incivility sort of a uh, uh, piece, I think. Right. I, and I want to, I, I want to end off and, you know, I mean, we can, we did, we spent, you know, a bit of time talking about what, what, what's bad, <laughs> what's bad and, you know, deterioration <laughs> yeah. of behavior, but there, there also is good, right? There's also mm -hmm. good. And I mean, you and other researchers are interested in, in something called the civil sphere, which mm -hmm. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a theory that was developed, um, in the U.S., I mean, it's kind of developing over a generation, really, and then it was uh, developed by a U.S. sociologist by the name of Jeffrey Alexander, and it basically it said, you know, in the economic, so we, if we can think, there are many different spheres in in society, right? And we can think about the economic sphere and the sort of the kind of dominant logic or the kind of governing ideal of the economic sphere is to is to generate business, make profit, let's say, right? The kind of the uh, the over the prevailing logic of the political sphere is to wield power, is to is to get power, right, and to to operate in ways that let you get and consolidate power and, and the idea is to say that there's this sort of realm of social life and it's abstract that we call the civil sphere and that its governing logic is solidarity and that the civil sphere 
uh, seeks to, it, the, it can expand or it can contract. So we can expand the groups or the persons with whom we feel solidarity or that might contract. And I think, you know, someone like Trump is seeking to kind of contract that and to consolidate solidarity among a particular, you know, particular sorts of uh, uh, class and, and, and race groups in the US, let's say, right? Um, but, you know, if we think, if we think about in, in Canada, we can think about how has this expanded over time? So if we think about the treatment historically, right, the, in Canada, the treatment of Indigenous people, right? Indigenous people were, you know, the, the, the civilized colonizers came, right? The English, uh, Anglo-Saxon colonizers come and they posit themselves as civilized um, and not even by implication, but explicitly say, well, the indigenous people who are here are barbarians, right? They literally, you know, use, deploy that kind of language. And then over time, right? Uh, and through, you know, a lot of so social movements, a lot of uh, legal maneuvering, a lot of self-advocacy, a lot of work being done on the part of indigenous people in Canada and allies, right? That has kind of helped to expand the sense of solidarity. Hold on a second. No, like we, we, we are, we are a we, right? If you mm -hmm. like, right? Solidarity yeah. means a kind of a sense of we ness, right? We could think about it in relation to, you know, a range of kind of historical issues in, in Canadian society, right? The, the Chinese head tax, uh, Japanese internment camps, right? They're, they're only possible when there isn't a sense of solidarity between what we might call core groups within a society and kind of new, newer entrants to a society, immigrant, whether they be immigrant groups or, or indigenous people, let's say, right? So how do we, how do we kind of, what are the what are the sorts of institutions, the mechanisms, the spaces, uh, the 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 ways that we can expand a sense of solidarity within a society? Right? Mm. So, art, literature is really important. Film, film, you know, is really important. Media is essential to this, and of course, the law is absolutely central. Right. But we can't rely, rely on the law to make change, to make the change, right? Yeah, Often yeah. Legal, you know, legal change like the decriminalization of homosexuality or uh, the the uh, the right to to gay marriage in Canada didn't just you know, was was the result of huge work for, of people in the LGBTQ community seeking to develop mm -hmm, solidarity mm -hmm, within the group mm -hmm. and, to, and to say, hold on a second, we're human. What are you talking mm -hmm. about? Right, we're part, we're part of you. Right? Is there is there a consensus among researchers in this field who work in civil in the civil sphere of Canada that you know that things are getting better, worse? They're the same. Like. What's the feeling of of what of the civil sphere in Canada right now? Are you looking for consensus among researchers uh, in social you're sciences? Right. What a dumb, <laughs> what a dumb thing to say. I, uh, I my, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, uh, those who want simple solutions should stick to mathematics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a, a American historian. I think said that. Um, you know, uh, you know. So th there's no consensus, but I would say, you know, it's uh, it's there's always tensions and contradictions at play. Right, um, you know, and I, 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 I don't really fully subscribe to the idea that there's cycles necessarily, right? Because that implies that there's just repetition, right? I think it's, um, you know, you can never step into the same society twice, right? Social mm. change, the only constant in society, one of the only constants is change, right? Yeah. But right. but we still have we still have things that stay stable, right? So for example, we agree that intimate relations are a really important part of life, and that societies should protect intimate relations. It's just that the form that those relations take are now different, right? right Previously, right. it was just, it was men and yeah. women. Now it's, now we have a much more diverse perspective on that. Yeah. But we still agree that intimate relations are important and that the state has some sort of responsibility to recognize and protect them in some way, for example, right? Yes. You know, so we can have, so that's, that's, we have a kind of a constant ideal of intimate relations being important, but what, the, what those look like has, has changed. And to my mind, changed in a good way because that's expanded the sphere of solidarity, right? Mm. Yeah. Is, is there, the thing I wonder too, um, as the sphere becomes larger, right, and includes more people, more groups, etc., um, does that have a counter effect at all in that there's a backlash against that from other people and other groups? For sure, For sure. absolutely, okay. right. So this is, you okay. know, so it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a swirl, right? It's a, yeah. it's filled with contradictions, right? So it's not, it's not just, it's like it happily, exp oh, look, we're just expanding, expanding, right? It gets punk. We can think of, you know, we want to think, think about it as a metaphor. It gets punctured, right? Or it gets squeezed in different ways, mm. right? Or potentially contorted, right? Uh, a sphere is a nice, you know, a sphere has got a kind of a nice inclusive sort of thing, but it's also bounded. It's also got boundaries, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so it's not just it's not just a blob, <laughs> right? <laughs> How, so we um, mm. we're we're still kind of making our way into twenty twenty four. This is a time. 
<laughs> this is a difficult question because I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you see in the year ahead? Um, uh, you know, and, and well, because I know you're very interested in these kind of the ways we interact, mm-hmm. with these public mm-hmm. settings, public spaces, um, maybe not even just this year, but sort of in the, you know, in the coming years. I mean, mm-hmm. what what do you, Maybe not what you predict, but what do you want to see? What do, what do you hope to see happen in this country, in Canada? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, at a, at a sort of a very basic level in terms of kind of municipalities and, and local government sort of, I mean, you know, we, we, local government often gets kind of short shrift, right? We yeah. talk about the province. We talk about those big issues of healthcare and housing, right. whether they're provincial and or, or federal immigration, federal sort of things. It's like at a, at a kind of a local level is, um, in like pay, like really taking seriously really mundane ordinary kinds of spaces that people share right and making our shared spaces livable like um i like the language of loitering drives me crazy no loitering Lo- loitering just means somebody lingering who you don't like that's what loitering is right nobody nobody complains about bay street lawyers loitering right at nathan phillips square right yeah. um, you know nobody 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 uses that language so so i think um post covid i think we we like we recognize the importance of public spaces through covid i think so i think enhancing um uh, spaces that we share making them spaces that are that are comfortable to be in for all people right that that are accessible um uh, in, in you know in all sorts of ways right that 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 are still free I think enhancing public institutions like libraries I think that's really really important um, these are these are spaces that sort of help to kind of bind us together there's a there's a sort of a, a term that's been started to be used a lot more over the last decade social infrastructure right we talk about material right. infrastructure yes. you know we talk about transport infrastructure as well what what is the infrastructure that allows us to be social right like so the, there's a, a book called palaces for the people that came out a few years ago and that's a um and it's essentially about the new york public library system more or less and looks at libraries as these sorts of spaces where kids from all kinds of backgrounds are sitting next to you know people who are who are street involved in some way and it's and it's and it's okay right it's good i love that title <laughs> yeah. palaces yeah. for the palaces people. for the people i probably do have that one you know what <laughs> i i think that's a term i i would mm-hmm. love that term to be applied to all kinds of spaces not just libraries Absolutely. Oh my goodness, Mervin, we could go on and on. It, it was sure. just, it was just fascinating exploring yeah, so many different areas of this with you. I really enjoyed it. Great. Thanks, Mary. I really Thank appreciate you. I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks very much. That is Mervin Horgan. He's an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Guelph. For more information on Mervin and his research, please check out our show notes. That is it for today's Cram podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Please follow us on social. Our handle is at Cram Ideas, and we would love a review. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here again.